Lord, we have gathered here to hear from you. Lord, we want to hear your truth by the power of your Holy Spirit. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's passage is Matthew 18. Our doctrine, sanctification. Our attribute, jealous. And our big idea, the Father's heart. Greatness. What comes to your mind when you hear this word? Great people who shaped our human history. Great minds who made amazing discoveries or improvements to our lives. Great artists, composers, and writers. Maybe even the forces of nature and the beauty of the nature. Today's story begins as Jesus' disciples came and asked Jesus a question on greatness. You see, the disciples had been discussing and arguing who is greatest among them. I wonder what their standards of greatness were. Prompted by their question, Jesus teaches them that the greatness in God's kingdom is marked by humility and forgiveness. Today, we will look at Matthew 18 in three divisions. Our first division, verse 1 through 9, Father's heart desires true greatness. Our second division, verses 10 through 20, Father's heart longs for humble restoration. Our third division, Verses 21 through 35, Father's heart requires forgiveness. And it is, our de- it is my desire that as we uh, look at Matthew 18 together, that God, would re- God would, will reveal Father's heart that desires true greatness, humble restoration, and forgiveness from the heart in his family. Diving into verse 1, the disciples ask, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? At this, Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them. Then Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, Whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. In an ancient world, children were not important. And children did not have much value until they could help with daily work. And yet, Jesus took a little child who is a helpless and powerless member in their society and told his disciples to number one, change and become like this child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Number two, take the lowly position of this child to be greatest, to be great in God's kingdom. And last, welcome such such a child in Jesus' name then you are welcoming Jesus. Why a child? Life of a, life of a little child is simple. It is humble. Child lives without ambition to accomplish or make a name for themselves. A child is dependent. Child is completely dependent on their caregiver to provide all their needs and wants. Child trusts. Without much control of their own lives, child simply trusts and obeys the caregiver. So how does a person, so how does a person change and become like a little child to enter the kingdom of God? That process may look like something like this. A person hears the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And with God's help, that person recognizes 
and believes that the only way to God is Jesus. And then forsaking that person's past life, past life of sin and all that person had been living in pursuit of. The person humbly forsaking it all. The person humbly cries out to God and invites God to be the person's Lord and King. And his or her only sufficient caregiver. Then trusting in God's promises, the person begins to live a new life as God's child, depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. With the little child standing among them, Jesus may be saying to the disciples that God is not impressed by how much you know. God is not impressed with how much you perform or how much you give or even what other believers think of you. Jesus may be saying, God cares more about the size of your heart that is humble and dependent on God while completely trusting in God. Then in verses 6 through 9, Jesus gives a warning to all of God's children who believe in him. Jesus clearly states not to, not to cause another believer in Jesus to stumble, causing them to sin. And Jesus also clearly challenges believers to remove things that cause them to stumble in sin. At first, a vivid description of punishment and cutting off of body parts sound gruesome and excessive. However, Jesus is warning his children to never play around with sin. Instead, separate themselves from sin. But I know me, and I'm sure you know you. (laughs) How can you and I, who find ourselves struggling with temptation and sin every day, heed this warning? Only by God and His powerful, sanctifying work in, in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 11 says that after we put our trust in Jesus, we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The moment a person becomes The moment a person comes to Christ for salvation and trusts in his sacrifice for their sin, Jesus' sinless perfection is immediately given to that person. This is justification, and it's a one-time transaction of God's declaration. After that, God begins a believer's sanctification process where a believer grows, grows in personal holiness to become more like Jesus. This is a lifelong process that is slow, but steady. It progress, the growth progresses over time and it's evident because God is the one who uses all things for our sanctification. Sometimes the sanctification process is painful, but it is always a productive process that calls us to turn away, that calls us to turn away from sin, to obey God because we want to please Him. When we believe that God actively uses anything and everything we face to sanctify us, and He is accomplishing His purifying work in us, we would stop resisting and fighting. When God shows us our sinful habits, we will run and depend on God to separate from those sinful habits by confessing our sins and relying on His power to help us break away from them. 
What are your current struggles and circumstances? Do you believe that God can use those, your present struggles and circumstances to sanctify you? Will you yield to our Father and His Word to grow your personal holiness to become more like Jesus? The more we learn to yield to Him, God will faithfully grow our sensitivity to the Spirit, God's Word, and His ongoing work in our lives. Here is our first principle. God defines true greatness as childlike childlike humility. God defines true greatness as childlike humility. Is your childlike humility growing? Is your dependence on God growing? Is your absolute trust in Jesus growing? Is Jesus becoming greater in your life while you become less? In our second division, we will see that Father's heart longs for restoration through verses 10 through 20. In verse 10 through 14, Jesus said, See, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of our Father in heaven. Here, Jesus is saying to the believers, Don't look down on or think little of your fellow believers, because God knows everything about his children and loves and values each one of them. You see, our Father is a jealous God. Unlike our human jealousy that stems from insecurities and fear, God's jealousy stems from His protective love for each of His children. Jesus explained this Father's heart for His children through a story of a man who owned 100 sheep. He owned 100 sheep. When one sheep wanders off, this man leaves the 99 sheep and goes out to look for that single wandering sheep. And Jesus says, Father's heart is like this man. Father's heart loves and longs to find the child of God who has wandered away. Our jealous father, full of grace, pursues his his child who has turned away from him and wandered away to chase lesser things and even commit sin. Wow. What is your heart attitude to our fellow believers? What is your heart attitude toward a fellow believer that has wandered off? In verses 15 through 20, Jesus, fully aware of our struggle against sin while living here on earth as God's children, Jesus gives a plan to fight together against sin and restore the one who is struggling with sin. In verse 15, Jesus said, If your brother or sister's If your brother or sister sins, go, go and point out their fault. This is a command, not a suggestion from Jesus. Though this can be hard. Yes, very hard. But as we pray and prepare our hearts and obey Jesus with humble attitude instead of anger or pride, I believe that God can use our obedience to help God's child to turn back to God in his way. Jesus' fourfold plan is like this. First, go to the offender privately with a motive of love and desire to make it as easy as possible for the wandering brother or sister to receive the message and make a change. The change of repentance turning away from whatever that sin is and turn towards God. 
If the person hears you, recognizes their sin, turns away from it and confesses their sin to God, then the relationship between believers is restored. Also, your fellow brother or sister's relationship with God is restored. However, if he or she refuses to repent, then the second step is to take two or three believers with you and go again to help the offender. If they refuse to repent, even after that, then Jesus said to bring the matter before the church. If they still refuse to repent, Jesus said to separate from such a person and treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Here, the word tax collector brings, brings to my mind Jesus' words from Matthew 9, 12 to 13. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. These words of Jesus reminds us that only God knows and understands the unrepentant heart. We can continue to pray and stand in the gap to ask God for his mercy. We can trust in God's sanctifying work in that person's life because of our Father's heart. Then in verses 18 through 20, Jesus repeats his words of authority given to his church as same as in Matthew chapter 16, 19. And Jesus assured his church of his presence and his power that will be with the restoration process. Here is our second principle. God calls his children to help each other and fight together against sin. God calls his children to help each other and fight together against sin. I know that the power of sin is destructive. Sin does not just affect the sinner, but sin affects the people around the sinner too. If God's children do not hear his call to help each other and fight together against the power of sin, the body of God becomes divided and fractured. How can a divided and fractured body of God accurately reflect the glory of God? How can a divided and fractured body of God relay the message of the gospel and the Father's heart to the dying world? The church's unity and purity is at stake here. In our Division 3, we will learn that Father's heart requires forgiveness through verses 21 through 35. After Jesus' instructions on how to restore a brother or sister in sin, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, asks him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Peter was being generous in saying seven times, since in their time the Jews were taught that forgiveness should be extended three times, only three times for the same offense. <coughs> Peter had more than doubled it. But Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Other translations, 70 times seven. In Jesus' answer, 77 times, Jesus it was speaking in metaphor for the need to always forgive and not carry a grudge. And we can see Jesus' message explained through the following parable in verses 23 
through 30. Jesus tells a story of a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. One servant owed the king 10,000 bags of gold. In today's currency, probably billions. It was such a great amount that he would not it was impossible for him to um, be able to pay back, even if he sold everything, including the freedom of his entire family. The servant fell to his knees and begged, Be patient with me. I will pay back everything. Despite his desperate cry, the king knew the servant would not be able to pay back. The king took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Freed and forgiven servant went out. And on his way out, he met a fellow servant who owed him only 100 silver coins. Now, 10,000 bags of gold that he owed, he was forgiven and freed. And he met the servant who owed him hundreds of silver coins. The servant grabbed and choked the fellow servant and demanded his payment. When the fellow, when, when the fellow servant fell to his knees and begged, the forgiven servant refused and imprisoned him. In verses 31 to 35, we see that other servants who saw what had happened tells the king everything. And king brings that freed and forgiven servant back to, back to him and says to him, you wicked, you wicked servant, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you. King became angry and handed him over to be tortured by jailers. Jesus ends the story with a serious warning that this is how the Heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Here, Jesus is asking us to forgive the offenses against us by other believers for two reasons. First, because Father God, the King, has forgiven us of our debts, saved us, and He continues to forgive us day after day. Second reason, as fellow believers, we understand and relate to our inability to always do the right thing. And this is so much of our struggle too. That brings us to our last principle. God calls his children to forgive others because, because God forgives us. God calls his children to forgive others because God forgives us. Are you quick to forgive others? Are there people from your past or present that you have been unwilling to forgive? I have some people that I need to forgive. And knowing that, knowing what, knowing what the Father God desires, I know that I need to go to God often and ask Him to search my heart and show me the people that I need to forgive. Children of God, let us strive and labor toward forgiveness with other believers, remembering that our Father's heart is for us and for them. And our Father's heart desires true greatness, humble restoration, and forgiveness from the heart in his family. Let's pray. God, thank you for teaching all of us how to relate to one another in the family of God this week. God, grow our humility. 
God, grow our dependence on you. God, grow our trust in you. God, help us to help us to help one another and fight together against sin. Merciful Father, thank you for forgiving each one of us. Help us to remember how much we have been forgiven by you so that we would choose to strive and labor toward forgiveness. Father, thank you for your great love and your heart for us. In Jesus' name, amen.